you've got questions about Stargate and we're here to answer them. I've really been looking forward to doing this. We did our first Stargate Q&A video back in the fall and I asked you to submit more questions and you did. You submitted a ton um, and I had just a crazy busy fall and then we moved house and now I got a new setup and we're ready to talk about Stargate. If you've got a question about the Stargate franchise, something from inside the lore, the mythology of the show, or about the production, just post it in the comments below. We'll do another one of these videos. Alan Harper, you asked a bunch of questions. Sorry, I'm just gonna take the first one here. What happens if you enter a Stargate wormhole from the wrong side? So rather than entering from the front, but from the back, I don't recall seeing anyone try this in any of the series. This is maybe the most common question that new viewers of the franchise ask after what happened to the Furlings. When are we gonna see the Furlings? Who are the Furlings? A Stargate, right, there's a front and a back, clearly. The back of the gate looks different and the back of the wormhole looks different. There's a few shots in the series where you'll see the camera move toward the back of an open wormhole and you can kind of see through to the other side. You can see the people approaching the gate. Whereas if you look at the wormhole from the front, you can't see through the event horizon like that. I think that indicates that you can't just walk through either side of the wormhole and get to your destination. If you have to walk through the front of the gate, what happens if you walk through the back? Or if you throw something through it? We don't know. The show never gave us any intel as to what would happen if matter passed through the back side of an open wormhole of the event horizon. I suspect that probably nothing would happen, but it wouldn't feel very good. The show doesn't really give us enough to suggest that matter would be destroyed if it hit the back of the Stargate, but you're still coming through that front part of the event horizon that serves to dematerialize you and transmit you through the wormhole. The short answer is we don't know, and I wouldn't recommend it. Grant Gordon, if a new Stargate show is made, would it be a new series or a continuation? Also, if it were a continuation, would it pick up with Atlantis Universe to actually finish that series, or would it pick up years later on Earth? We do know that series co-creator Brad Wright has a pitch and also a pilot script for a new Stargate series. It hasn't gotten a green light yet because we're waiting for Amazon's acquisition of MGM to be complete before Amazon and MGM decide what they're gonna do with the franchise and if they're gonna make Brad's new show. If it is Brad's fourth show, I think your latter suggestion is right. It's going to be a continuation of the existing canon, but it's gonna jump forward to the present day. Stargate has always been set in the present day, and Brad has voiced again and again that he thinks it's important that Stargate is us. It's the here and now, it's present day. So it's not gonna pick up in 2011 where Stargate Universe left off, and it's not gonna to jump to the far future, to the 2080s or the 23rd century and do a Stargate the next generation. It's gonna be a new team with opportunities for some of our old favorite cast members to come back and make guest appearances at the very least. So it's gonna be a continuation if Brad's project gets made. It's gonna be set in the existing universe. It's gonna honor the existing canon. And that gives Brad the opportunity, Brad and, and the writers that are hired, it would give them the opportunity to go and answer some of those questions that are still lingering from Atlantis and Universe. Both of those shows were cut off before their stories were finished. Is Atlantis still in the Milky Way galaxy? Is it still on Earth outside of San Francisco Bay? Is the crew of Destiny still in stasis? Did they ever solve the mystery of the cosmic microwave background radiation? Brad can answer those questions in some way, shape, or form but they probably would not be the focus of a new show. A new show would be about a new storyline with a new group of characters that can make reference to things in the past. Right, we can bring on Rodney McKay and have him talk about how Atlantis went back to the Pegasus galaxy and maybe the Wraith are still an ongoing threat, but that's probably about it. We're not gonna get a third season of Universe. I mean, we can hope for a movie. I'd love to see a tie-up movie where we brought back the cast of SGU who, because of stasis, right, they're a little bit older, just like the actors are now a decade older. Amazon certainly has deep enough pockets to make that happen. I would keep my expectations low and hope for the best. Pup314, with the return of Atlantis to Earth, has the Stargate program now become public? 
This is the million dollar question. And again, for any possibility of what might happen in future Stargate storytelling, we have to look at what we know about Brad's pitch, his script for a new Stargate series. Uh, and he's told us explicitly that in that world, the Stargate program has been made public. There's hints that he gave in a podcast conversation with David Hewlett that there might be some equivalent of a Stargate Academy, uh, maybe a new branch of the military like the Space Force that is running the Stargate program and training up people to serve in it. So the Stargate is public knowledge. I don't know that it looks like it does in the episode 2010, where the gate itself is used by the public for travel off world. More likely it's still in the hands of, of the military or some uh, Stargate command organization, some international organization. So I think it will be public knowledge, but not used by the public. Cameron Meyer asks, and spoiler alert for the end of Stargate Atlantis, if you haven't seen season five yet, in season five, we find out that the Asgard are not extinct. The ships they had looked like Atlantis technology, were they? Also, could we assume they were as technologically advanced as the Asgard in the Milky Way? So after the Asgard put an end to their civilization in the final episode of Stargate SG-1, on Atlantis, we get a, a bit of a rebirth. Daniel Jackson and Rodney McKay discover that there is a lost tribe, a colony of Asgard who broke away 10,000 years ago and they've been studying their cloning problem in secret in the Pegasus galaxy. So they have another 10 years of development of their own ideology and their own technology. Are they as technologically advanced as the Asgard that we knew? I'd say it's a, it's a jump ball. They're probably in the ballpark, right? A lot can happen in 10,000 years, but if they started at the same point of development and they each went their own separate ways, they might not be as developed because they were a breakaway group, but they were technologically minded. So they were looking to work on the cloning problem without the constraints of normal Asgard scientific and medical ethics. One thing that the show has suggested to us, at least in the reuse of props, is that those Asgard, their unofficial nickname is the Veneer from Norse mythology, the Veneer found other people's tech and made use of it. And that's because the suits that they have appear to be ancient. Those EVA suits discovered on Destiny look very much like the combat suits that the Asgard were using, just with different helmets. So I think the Veneer did not discover Atlantis. They're not using Atlantis tech necessarily, but they probably came upon some technology that was developed by the ancients. And there could be tech all over the place, tech as old as Destiny that these Asgard found and made their own. I'm gonna apologize right now for mispronouncing some of your names. Kingifis Hayuge says, can Atlantis dial Destiny if it had three ZPMs? We covered this a little bit in our first Q&A video, which is linked up here in this card. The bigger question is, could we reach Destiny? How might we be able to do it with the technology that we have, particularly through Atlantis? So a couple of questions on this track here. Number one, if Atlantis was fully powered, if it had three fully charged working ZPMs, are its drives fast enough to reach Destiny? I'll qualify this first by saying, we don't really know for sure where Destiny is. It has not necessarily been traveling in a straight line away from the Milky Way galaxy. It might be traveling in more of a spiral pattern over the course of many millions of years as it's searching the universe for clues. But in terms of what a fully powered ancient city ship like Atlantis could do, I think technologically speaking, the answer is no. That drive is not gonna be powerful enough even when it's fully charged, to go out and reach the destiny. Even if we knew exactly where destiny is, it's so many galaxies away that it would probably take multiple lifetimes for Atlantis, for its normal star drive, fully powered, to reach it. But now we know from the final episode of Stargate Atlantis that the regular star drive is not the only option that Atlantis has. So Elementary72 Gaming now asks, isn't the Atlantis engine the best hope to catch Destiny since they have a wormhole drive? Several of you in fact pointed out the fact that Atlantis has a wormhole drive. We've only seen it used one time. This was in the final episode of Atlantis when they used it to bring the city to Earth to defend the planet from the Wraith. 
So we know very little about what the wormhole drive is and how it functions other than that the basic principle is that it operates kind of like a Stargate does. It uses wormholes rather than hyperspace conduits so it can travel from point A to point B much faster than just kicking the engine into full gear and trying to cover the distance between galaxies. Again, the short answer is we don't know, but I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say no, even with a functioning wormhole drive, and even if you knew exactly where Destiny was located, you still couldn't reach it. That's how far away Destiny is. It's many, many, many galaxies from here. It's been traveling for hundreds of thousands of years, if not actually many millions of years. We think it's millions of years because it's much older technology than Atlantis itself. As far as we know from the canon of the shows, the only way to reach Destiny is with a nine chevron address. Now, if the wormhole drive operates on Stargate principles, could you input coordinates that were the equivalent of dialing the nine chevron address? Well, maybe, I guess if the writers need it for the story, they could make it happen, but count me as a skeptic. Stargamer LP asks, could there be more destinies? I mean, the flight path for the destiny wouldn't cover the entire universe like it seemed to be needed. I think something like five other destiny type ships would probably be able to cover our universe. And the reason why their addresses aren't in the Atlantis database or were very well hidden could be because, for example, one ship was destroyed, two other ones lost contact. This is a great idea. I love the fact that Destiny was such a, a big and important project for the ancients many, many millions of years ago that they might have built and launched more than one ship. If it's that important, you know, there's lots of hazards out there, right? Your ship could crash into a star. It could get taken over by aliens. Uh, it makes sense that there's more than one other ship out there. And over the course of many millions of years, as you say, maybe even before Atlantis and its database were ever created, those ships lost touch. Those ships became unreachable by Stargate. I think that's entirely plausible. The show doesn't give us any evidence that that's the case, that there were ever multiple ancient ships other than the seed ships that were sent out ahead of Destiny. But it strikes me as entirely plausible. The only reason to think that Destiny may be one of a kind is, as you suggest, we only found one nine chevron address. There could be many, many other nine chevron addresses, but I don't know, if I was good at file keeping, I'd keep them all together. So the fact that we found one and only one nine chevron address maybe works against our theory. So speaking of Stargates, let's talk about the original feature film and the coordinate system for dialing Stargate addresses that the movie introduced and the show took on, but then over the course of a few years, the show kind of modifies what it does with addresses. Dennis Field says, the symbols on the Stargate are pictographs of the constellations in the sky as seen from Earth. But if you gated to a different planet halfway across the galaxy, then even if some of the same stars were visible, the constellations would have different patterns because you would be viewing them from an entirely different perspective. Why doesn't each planet have its own set of symbols or at least different symbols the further away you get from Earth? This is a really excellent question about the way that the Stargate network functions. So I think there's the practical production reason, and then there's also the in-canon lore reason. Practically, for production purposes, of course, they didn't want to replace all 39 symbols on the Stargate every time we went to another planet. It was enough work for the production just to raise the location Stargate every time they were on location somewhere. It's also really impractical for the team to have to go and look around and find the address to Earth everywhere they went. That was a crucial plot point in the feature film, of course. They had to find the address back to Earth. But when you're doing a weekly adventure show, you don't want to get bogged down in Daniel trying to learn the language or trying to locate the address back home to Earth. You can't really have a functioning show or a functioning Stargate program if every single planet uses a different set of symbols. So the television show simplified this a little bit. They used the same symbols on the gate and then often they would change out one and the team would recognize a symbol that's not on their gate, a symbol that they didn't know from other planets. And they would draw the logical inference that that was this new planet's point of origin. So that maintains some consistency with the existing setup for Stargate addresses, but maybe fudged it a little bit. 
So if the production reason ultimately comes down to practicality for weekly storytelling, the in-canon lore answer I think is, is actually pretty interesting and, and pretty consistent. Eventually we learn that the Ancients, the builders of the Stargate network, lived on Earth. That's where Atlantis took off from millions of years ago, uh, and that's probably where they lived when they created the Stargate network. So for the development of the Ancients and their mythology, it actually becomes pretty important that the symbols on the Stargates all across the galaxy are star constellations as seen from Earth. That connects Earth with the Ancients. Now that does mean that Daniel's explanation in the movie about finding a destination by using six coordinates in space, with the seventh being the point of origin in order to chart a course, that's not actually how the Stargate system works. As the show went on, it becomes clear that there's just one address to Earth, and teams that go off-world just have Earth's address memorized, and they can dial it no matter where they're at. So it seems that what the Ancients did, despite Daniel's theory in the original movie, what the Ancients actually did was they created a fixed coordinate system. If the Stargate symbols were originally based on constellations as seen from the planet Earth, well, that's where the pictographs came from, but ultimately they just came to be numbers, for lack of a better concept. And so there's a specific code, there's a specific telephone number that you can dial, and no matter where you dial it from, you're always going to get Earth. Brad Wolf 07. Okay, my question is a bit involved. It sure is, Brad. Let me cut to the chase here. At one point in the episode, Window of Opportunity, Daniel Jackson states that this was a colony of ancients that had this time loop device. So Brad's question is, when in the series timeline did this colony of ancients experience their cataclysm? This was early in the fourth season of Stargate SG-1. Love this episode. Everybody loves the time loop episode. It was a point where we didn't know who the ancients were yet. All we knew about the ancients at this point was that they had built the Stargate network, they were once part of the great alliance of four races, and that they had moved on from our part of space long ago. Window of Opportunity suggests that, in fact, there was a plague. The ancients suffered an illness that nearly threatened to destroy their species. So let's situate ourselves here to the ancient timeline. They start out in another galaxy, that's the Ori home galaxy, then they emigrate to the Milky Way galaxy, they land first at the planet Dakara, and they spread out. They create multiple colonies across the Milky Way, including landing on Earth, and over the course of many millions of years, they do things like launch the Destiny, uh, create the Stargates, create the city of Atlantis. We think that Atlantis left the Milky Way galaxy in part because of that plague. And that's because they left Ayana behind. Ayana is this ancient woman at the beginning of Rising. She's in the very first scene of the first episode of Stargate Atlantis. This was the same woman that SG-1 discovered frozen in the ice of Antarctica back in Season 6's episode Frozen. When they thawed her out, she was miraculously still alive, and she had some pretty evolutionarily advanced powers, like the ability to heal others with a touch. Ayana carried that disease. So that's probably what that look with the other ancient was about when Atlantis was leaving. She had to stay behind, not because the ancients needed someone to keep the lights on on Earth, but because she was infected. So the ancient colony that SG-1 finds in Window of Opportunity, which had created a time loop machine in order to try and solve the plague, to solve the, the problem that had befallen their civilization, that was probably fairly early in the Ancients' development. It was before Atlantis went to the Pegasus galaxy. The Ancients then lived in Pegasus for millions of more years, and the more recent ancient history is when they came back. They gated back to Earth 10,000 years ago. That's when the scientist Janus was alive, and that's when some of the Ancients successfully achieved ascension. Did I answer the question? Here's a question from Dark Arts Mage. You're talking about a couple of episodes of Atlantis when the team discovered ancient warships. One of these is in the Season 2 episode Aurora. The ship's name is the Aurora. Towards the end of Season 2 in the episode Inferno, they find another one. This one was called the Hippophoralcus, and so they renamed it the Orion. 
And the other one is in season three in The Return. We get a crew of ancients come back to Atlantis and it looks like they haven't really aged. They've been traveling for a while, but they don't look like they're 10,000 years old. That ship is called the Tria. So Dark Arts Mage, your question is, why was the ancient crew from the Tria visibly younger than the ancients on the Aurora? Both of those crews were out there fighting the Wraith conflict 10,000 years ago, but the ones on the Aurora were super old. And even if they had left their stasis pods, they would have died of old age. So you're exactly right here. The crew of the Aurora were in stasis pods and we only saw them in the VR context. Meanwhile, their bodies had aged and died and they could not have lived outside of the VR world anymore. But then in season three, when the crew of the Tria shows up, they look like they haven't aged all that much. They're a living, breathing Lantean crew from 10,000 years ago. The answer to your question is Einstein. It's the principle that time is relative. You might have heard this idea from science class that if you got into a ship and launched yourself from Earth, traveling at or near the speed of light, then when you return to Earth, a few hours or days will have passed for you. Meanwhile, your loved ones will be many, many years older. And this is the difference with these two ships. The Aurora had broken down. When the Atlantis team found it, it was not traveling near the speed of light. It was derelict. So it had literally been sitting out there for 10,000 years. The crew was dead. Their conscious minds were being kept alive inside the VR construct. This is the ultimate tragedy that the captain of the ship has to explain to his crew, is that they were willing to go out in a blaze of glory to deal one more defeat to the Wraith because they were already dead. The Tria, meanwhile, had been fighting the Wraith out on the edge of the galaxy and had been traveling back home, except their drives were not working quite at full efficiency, so they were traveling back to Atlantis at a little bit less than the speed of light. That means the crew of the Tria probably experienced only a few months or maybe several years and not the 10,000 years that had passed for Atlantis. It's very sciencey, I know. It's hard to wrap your brain around. We got to get an SGU question in here for our last one. Stephen Didcote brings up the Novans. So we had this colony of Novans that had been separated from the rest of their civilization and Destiny and its crew was trying to bring them home. We found the planet Novus, but it had been evacuated. The Novans were on their way to another planet to settle and rebuild their civilization. Stephen says, after visiting Novus, we dropped them off at an undisclosed planet where the population was using the Stargate to evacuate to before their gate was destroyed. Couldn't we have asked them how to cure Lieutenant Johansson? Surely they would have taken some form of their database with them while they were evacuating through the Stargate before it was destroyed. So this is a really good question. This was part of the plot of the episode epilogue. We found out that TJ has ALS. She hasn't experienced any symptoms yet, but this crippling disease is in her future. Now the Novans have found a way to cure her. Uh, we got part of their database downloaded, but it's gonna take days, weeks, maybe years to sift through the knowledge of that culture and see if the part of the database we got even has the cure in it. Well, if we can find Novans, can't we just ask them if they took the cure with them? So it's a very good question. I had to go back to the transcript of this episode to figure out what was going on. And here's the key exchange from the end of the episode. Uh, what about the ships that they used to evacuate Novus? They probably took a copy of the archive with them. So when we drop people off on the planet- They won't be there yet. The ships don't have FTL. They won't arrive for 200 years to find them in the middle of empty space. But TJ, there's there's so much else that did make it in the transfer. A, a ton of other medical s stuff. We can learn from it. From our descendants. We will figure out a cure. So the Novans didn't use Stargates to evacuate their population, probably because they were resettling on planets that didn't have gates. They did have ships though, and what Eli suggests is that those ships can't move very fast. They're not actually on their new planet yet, and Destiny is gonna pass them. So Destiny's gonna go to their destination basically, and this lost colony are gonna get there first. They're gonna get there before the, the other colony ships show up. 
So we don't have access to the database, assuming that the Novans brought it with them, unless Destiny could find them somewhere in the middle of deep space. Thanks everyone for your awesome questions. These videos are a ton of fun to do, so please give me more. Leave your questions about Stargate lore, about specific episodes or plot points, or about the show's production. Maybe what we're hoping for from the future of the franchise. Leave those in the comments below. Let us know what you think of this video and the format, and we'll see you next time.